start today and remind ourselves that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Say that with me. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not unlikely, but impossible. Now, the Bible will bring you, if you read it accurately, into another dimension of life. The Bible is not like any textbook you may find anywhere, nor is the Bible like any other religious book. I do not take the religious books of the world, be that the Quran or anything else, lay them on a table and say, well, the Bible is simply one of those. That is not true. For one, the Bible is unique in prophecy. You will not find prophecy in the Quran. Why? Because false prophets cannot accurately predict the future, but you will find in the Bible thousands of prophetic words which have come true in the life of humanity, of the, perhaps the most greatest one in our time, all the prophetic word that said Israel would return. Can a nation be born in a day, said the prophet, and yet it will be. And liberals and Bible deniers laughed at that for years, but in 1948 the nation of Israel came alive in one day. And ancient people recovered their ancient language, recovered the land that God had promised them. The Bible is unique in being fulfilled uh, with prophecy. But the Bible is also unique in that it describes a dimension that you and I can live in that Yeshua called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now, some people mistakenly believe that the kingdom of heaven is heaven where we're going to go to, but Yeshua said the kingdom of heaven is here and now, and he walked out his life in this, in this earth living the principles of that kingdom. Paul is very clear that the Son of God set aside all his rights and prerogatives as God, humbled himself and became obedient and took on flesh, the same flesh you and I have, and therefore everything he did, everything he lived out, he did with the same power and authority that is available to you and to me. That's the only way we can understand why Yeshua would constantly say to those around him, where was your faith? Why didn't you speak to that? Why didn't you walk on the water? Why didn't you do these things? Because he fully believed that if you and I understand what faith is, we can step into a dimension of faith where all things are possible. All things are possible. And yet the church has sold us pretty short in terms of what faith can produce. Well, you can't have this and you can't have that. Well, as for me and my house, uh, we're changing all of that. Amen? So we're going to talk about some of the dimensions of faith today and how to get to those uh, higher dimensions. Uh, if you start reading simply quickly through the book of Genesis, you'll find that creation itself is from a different dimension. It is such a different dimension that Modern secular education can't even understand it. Uh, they would rather deal with evolution, but when evolution doesn't work, nowadays supposedly reputed scientists are even willing to consider that life began because an alien from another planet brought it here. How far can you go from uh, avoiding having to deal with there is a story in the Bible of another dimension where God said and it was. That's the dimension yeah, the Bible lives in. There's Noah and the flood. That certainly is a story from another dimension. There is the destruction supernaturally of Sodom and Gomorrah. That is from another dimension. There's the birth of Isaac when Abraham was 100 years old fulfilling the promise of God. Something from another dimension. There is the longevity of the patriarchs from another dimension. By the way, you don't need to be taking notes on all of this because we have them printed out but I left them to give to you afterwards because I knew you'd all kind of cheat and go ahead if I gave them to you ahead of time. Amen. Let's look at the supernatural in the book of Exodus. We find that there are the supernatural plagues on Egypt. There is light in the land of Goshen when all of Egypt is in darkness. We find the Egyptians turning and giving all their wealth over to the Israelites the night that they're going to leave. That certainly had to be a supernatural intervention. 
There was the fact that there was not one sick among the thousands who leave Egypt. Not one of them, the Bible tells us, was sick. There was no infirmity. That's an impossibility when you look at three to six million people who have been slaves that as they leave, it's not like Cecil B. DeMille's made in his movie, The Exodus, where people are limping and being carried out on stretchers. That might be humanness, but that's not what happened according to the Bible. There was not one infirm person. That blood of the Passover lamb put on the doorpost of their house healed every single disease among God's people. That is living in another dimension. There is the manna in the desert. There is the quail that came supernaturally for meat. There was water from a rock. There was the presence of God at Mount Sinai. All signs of another dimension impacting us here on planet earth. Then we go to the book of Joshua, and it continues there. We find the Jordan River is stopped upriver. It's flood season. The Jordan River can't stop, and yet when the priests put their feet in that water to cross the Jordan River, it stopped up so they could cross on dry land. There are the walls of Jericho that collapse at the sound of the shofar and the sound shouting of the people. But if you really want to hear something from another dimension in the book of Joshua, look at this one. Joshua said, O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon, over the valley of Agilon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. You say, Pastor, do you really believe that? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it violates all the laws of nature. No, it violates all the laws you know about nature. But it does not violate the laws of God because God is a law-abiding God. Amen. We can look at other evidences of living in another dimension in the Old Testament. Massive enemy ar armies are routed because they hear the sounds in the mulberry trees. There's a Shunammite woman's son raised from the dead. There's the widow's oil who, that multiplies Elijah carried up into the heavens. Waters of Jordan splitting for Elijah. Naaman cured of leprosy simply by dipping in the Jordan River. An axe head floats on the water for the prophet. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego are saved from the fiery furnace. Daniel is saved from the lion's den. All acts of God, of people learning how to live in another dimension. Let me remind you that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that Daniel, that the prophets who, who spoke did not have the advantage of the Brit Shah, the new covenant. They did not have that relationship in Yeshua. But nevertheless, they were able to enter into a dimension to walk with God in the supernatural. If I had my choice and had to make a choice, I would choose to live like they live. Can you say so? In the New Testament, that whole evidence of living in another dimension continues. Water is turned into wine. Powerful storms are stilled. Demon-possessed men are delivered. Men walk on water. Miraculous prosperity happens with a catch of fish. Thousands are fed with just a few loaves and fishes. As blind men regain their sight. Leprosy disappears. Men are raised from the dead. It keeps going on and on. Evidence of the ability to live above the circumstances of this life. To step into a dimension where you're living as if from another world, another dimension. Can you say amen? If you really want to get into that, get to what Paul said. I know a man in Christ, says Paul, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Pastor, what on earth is a third heaven? We'll talk about that sometime. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things things that man is not permitted to tell. This man, Paul, many of us believe that was, he's talking about himself, stepped in to a level of another dimension that was so outside the scope of his mind's ability to comprehend it that when he comes back, he can't tell us what he saw. Can that happen? Oh, yes, I saw Brother Hagin step into one of those places one time. People say, oh, do you really believe that stuff? You make your choice, but I'm going to believe what the Bible says. Can you say amen? Glory to God. How do we get there? If we're going to get into those other dimensions, we've got to come to a place, like Paul says in Romans 12, 32, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you're not willing to renew your mind, come on, 
you're not going to understand the dimensions of God. If you're not willing to park your education, come on, if you're not ready to get rid of some stinking thinking, and if you went to public school education, I guarantee you, you have a lot of stinking thinking in there. You and I were trained to think wrong. Amen. We're raising up a generation of young people now who are being trained to think right. They're going to walk in things because they don't have to get over the negatives and the cannots and the can't do's, and we, we know the limits. How many of you are aware, if you've been in this congregation, you are now, <laughs> how many of you are aware that the speed of light is no longer considered absolute? <laughs> the old rule that you and I grew up with, you can't go faster than the speed of light. Quantum physics says that just isn't so. In fact, the speed of light is slowing down, and we have scientific e evidence of that. All the things that you may have learned in your physics books, in your chemistry books, in your biology books are up for grabs when it comes to stepping in to another dimension. You're going to have to renew your mind. Turn to the person next to you and say, you got to renew your mind. All right. Well, let's, let's, let's look at your little thing there. Some of you may have known how to do this. How, how, do you, how do you draw four lines and connect the dots without picking it off the paper? It's very simple. Line one goes like that. Line two goes like that. Line three goes like that. And line four goes like that. And there's four lines that connect them all. I never had to pick it up from the paper. Here's the question. Who said you had to stay in the box? Ah, you made an assumption. You were trying to connect those dots within the box, but nothing in the instruction book said you've got to stay in the box. You don't, you don't need to stay in that box. And if you look in the instruction manual we've got, nothing here says you've got to stay in the box of human thinking. There's nothing in this book that, that says that your life has got to be whatever your, ever your neighbors say, your friends say, your family says, what your pastors say, what other people say. No, this is an out-of-the-box book. Yes, it is. Amen? Th this will get you out of the parameters of your family heritage. It'll move you out of things that have always been. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So let's check the dimensions in which you live. I'm talking about you. Turn to somebody and say, he's talking about me. <clears throat> so let's check you out here. Let's find out how good you are. The shortest, we all know these things, by the way. This isn't a hard test class. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Oh, unless those points are on a sphere. Come on, a straight line exists in a flat, a flat dimension. But the minute you look at a sphere, you go to another dimension. That is no longer true. Any of you who have flown and you followed, if you go to Israel with us, and, and, and you, you have a little map all the way over there, this little thing is showing where you're flying. And you're thinking, wait a minute, I'm in New York, and there's Israel. So I want to fly from New York to Israel. What on earth are we doing going north and going over Gander, Newfoundland, why are we going out over the North Atlantic, coming down through France, uh, across Italy to, to, get to, to get to Israel? Why are we doing this when I look at a map and it seems like we should do that? And it's because the shortest distance between two points on a sphere is not a straight line, it's a curve. Glory to God. That is the great circle root in the red. Here's what a short line would be from Tokyo to San Francisco, would be the black. The red is the great circle root. It's actually shorter mileage than if you go the black. Now, coming, by the way, west to east, they will fly the green route only because they have a jet stream going at about 300 miles an hour that gives them a boost. But they still, you see, are making somewhat of a loop there. But the great circle route is the shortest distance. You say, well, how would I figure that out? Well, if you really want to calculate the shortest distance on a sphere, uh, there's the formula. I don't know what it means. I've long since forgotten what those deltas and alphas and sines and all that stuff. I think back in trigonometry somewhere, I think I might have had that, or I don't know. I don't even know what that math is called anymore. But better minds than I figure it out. But I, I do know one thing, that the shortest distance between two points I got to know what you're talking about on a piece of paper or a sphere before I can tell you with accuracy that it is a straight line. Well, how about the number of degrees in a triangle? Come on, class. The number of degrees in a triangle is 
180. All right, that's good. That is really good, uh, unless the triangle is on a sphere. Oh, my, you kind of figured that. If you look at the lower right there, there is a triangle on a flat map. And you have a 90-degree angle, a 50-degree angle, and a 40-degree angle equals 180. But if you go to the equator of the planet Earth, and you go down and you go 90 degrees up here and 90 degrees up here, you're on the meridians, you'll end up at a 50 degree angle at the North Pole because the sphere, it's all going to end up there. 90 and 90 is 180 and 50 is 230. That triangle has 230 degrees. So how many degree in a triangle? Well, first you've got to tell me where the triangle is. They never teach you to ask that question. Come on. That it depends upon what dimension you're talking about. Well, you know, pa Pastor, you, 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 don't, you don't really believe that healing can take place in this terrible case here. Well, it depends upon what dimension you want to live on. If you want to live on the dimension of the doctor, the nurse, the chemi chemist, and the, all the people there, if you want to live on the dimension of this earth, you're absolutely right. Let's plan the funeral. But if you want to step into a higher dimension, I don't care how many times and how many doctors and how many say Ashley's going to die. She didn't die. Why? Because we stepped into another dimension. From the dimension that we live in in this earth, people can understand that. So they want to gather the psychiatrist to figure out with Donna why she can't accept reality is your child's going to die. Something's wrong with the mother. She's not dealing with reality. No, she's not dealing with your reality. She's dealing with another reality. You're writing on a piece of paper. She's writing on a sphere. Glory to God. Another dimension. Are we on the same page here? What, what is a point in space? Well, here we go. In geometry, points have neither volume, area, length, nor any other higher dimensional analog. Thus, a point is a zero-dimensional object. Let me illustrate a point for you. That's not a point. It's got size. Can you see it? Okay. Well, that's not a point. We'll make it smaller. We'll make it smaller. We'll make it smaller. We, we still haven't got to the place of a point because what? It has area. Here we go smaller and... Oh, the last, can you see that last little one? But that's still not a point because it's got area and size to it. Now watch this. Don and I are reading about Sabbath. And here's what they say about Sabbath. In, in the article about Sabbath, the geometric point possesses no area. As such, it would seem to hardly qualify as a component of space. In truth, of course, the very opposite is true. The point is the most basic component of all geometric forms. Every line is defined by points that mark its beginning, its end, its center, and the convergence it has with other lines. This is exemplified by the circle's center. A mere point, the center, occupies none of the circle's area. Do you get that? The center of a circle is a point. It, the, the minute you put a dot there, it's got area. That's not a point. A point has no area, okay? But it is precisely the center that makes the circle the circle. We define the circle by referencing where it is from that point. The radius extends from it. The diameter turns on it. The circumference is drawn in relationship to it. Virtually every feature and characteristic of the circle is derived from the point upon which it is centered. Now you say, well, what's the point? Sabbath is a point in the calendar of the week. When you get into a dimension of Sabbath, you're in a dimension where the week gets defined by the point. Sabbath defines the week. Mon you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are days that only have meaning in God's dimension because of Shabbat. When you fill Shabbat with its intended purpose, it'll change your week. When you play with Shabbat like you do with Sunday, oh, I give it a little hour here, I spend two hours here, but then I go and do other things on Shabbat. When I don't honor Shabbat, it messes up the week around Shabbat, which is being defined by its center. Glory to God. Well, I can't see that honoring from Friday night to Saturday night and not doing work and not, I, I can't see that that's going to have any impact. You can't see a point. You can't see a point. But by definition, the point is the center of everything that's going on. Are you still with me? So let's talk about flatlanders. 
Flatlanders and other dimensions. Now, flatlanders are those people who live in two dimensions. If you were to get in math, it's a fun little exercise. But a, but a flatlander lives in a world where there, there's length and width, but there's no depth. It doesn't know depth. Okay? So even, we, we use a piece of paper as an illustration, but it's not quite accurate because p this paper has depth. It has, it has you can, I can't measure it, but you, but you can't, it can be measured. But for purposes sake, this is where a flatlander lives. Lives in this two-dimensional. You and I are three-dimensional. We can throw time in and say that we're four-dimensional, but let's keep it simple right now. A flatlander lives in a two-dimensional world, okay? So let's talk about what he did. How do you get a flatlander to understand a three-dimensional world? How do, you, how do you get them to do that? How are you going to get them to step out of everything they know into a world they don't know? See, you look at it and say, well, it's simple. No, it's simple to you because you live in a three-dimensional world. But a flatlander living in a two-dimensional world has no concept. You know, it's like the story of the, of the fish that's out there swimming and somebody catches him on a hook, jerks him out, you know, into a boat, holds him up, looks at him, holds him up in the sun, says, well, he's too small, takes a hook out of his mouth and throws him back. How is he going to describe that to his fellow fish? Because the only thing they know is the world of the ocean. Well, this creature from where? They don't know what's out there from somewhere else. Reached in, grabbed me, pulled me up. There were these big beings, and they did all kinds of things, and they threw me back in, and here I am again. I went into another world, and the fish would say, you got to go to the insane asylum. <laughs> how, how do we get a flatlander to understand a three-dimensional world? Here's the flatlander's view of the world. It's flat and two-dimensional. So you can imagine that's a piece of paper. That's how they look at the world. And because that's how they look at the world, they don't understand three dimensions. They don't look at that and say, that's a box or a cube. They, they, there's, no, there's no boxes and cubes because there's depth, and, and they don't have that in their world. Other dimensions, now, now I want you to get hold of this one. Other dimensions to a flatlander will always appear two-dimensional. Let me explain what I mean here. So there's their view of the world. It's flat. And you come along to a flatlander and say, but there's really another dimension. And so in their mind, here's what they think. Okay, there's another dimension above mine, but what is it? It's still a sheet of paper. <coughs> it's still flat. And you say, okay, well, let's go up to the third heaven then. But what am I looking? I'm looking at the third heaven from the same way I look here. It's flat. It's just a piece of paper. Why? That's all I can conceive. I can't, I can't imagine another dimension. So when you talk about other dimensions to a flatlander, all they see the other dimensions are just like this one. Most people see heaven as you're living now. That's why the, 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 they came to Yeshua and said, listen, uh, you know, there was a, a, a challenge, a, you know, a, a, a man, the, the one with different spouses, you know, one died, had another spouse, died, had another spouse. Well, who's the right spouse in heaven? And Yeshua said, you don't understand. In heaven, you know, men are not given in marriage and, and so forth. And that's not the relationships in heaven. And so what do we do? We try to take all of our knowledge from here and apply that to what he said. Well, what are we, all singles up there? You know, are we some kind of a, you know, uh, you know ge generic being up there? I mean, and, and people try to build all kinds of theology about what Yeshua said because they're taking this dimension of what we know, trying to put it with his answer and stick it up into heaven, and it's not there. Amen? Hallelujah. When we talk about uh, other dimensions, we got to realize that a lot of times what we're projecting in our mind is this life better. Heaven isn't this life better. And the dimension of faith is nothing that you know in the natural made better. It is an entirely different dimension and way of thinking. So let's upgrade your view of the world. Okay? There's the flatlander. They, they're, they're just got a sheet of paper. But what if I took another flatlander sheet of paper and I brought it down, except I put it at 90 degrees and laid it 
at, at the edge of that sheet, and then I brought another one up, and I brought it up from the bottom, same flatlander view, and I put it there, and then I took one and I slid it across from the back, and, and I put that one there, and then I bring another one uh, from the left side and bring it over and put it there, and then I'm going to bring one from the right side and bring it over and, and put it in there, and I've taken all these flatlander views of the world, but I've constructed a, a whole new dimension. Can you see that? Some people live only on their side and can't see the truth of other points of view. Come on. They live within the framework of me, myself, and all I've ever understood, what my church taught me, what I've always believed. I've always believed it. Don't confuse me with any new knowledge. And we live in this little, and we gather around in a holy huddle, staying in our own line of thinking, and we can't step out of the box that we have constructed in the church, a theological box that therefore gives us one view of the world and all other views are wrong, and therefore it will be hard to get into another dimension. You're limited by the dimension you're walking in. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So let's look at the space-time dimension. That's the world we live in. It began at creation, and it seems to be moving in one direction. From creation, it moves forward, space, time. Space and time. Space, height, depth, length, time, the passage of time as an object moves through that. That constitutes the world you and I know. That's the world we live in. Everything is, is down in this dimension of four-dimensional space-time. But there is another dimension called eternity, and another name for that is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God dimension. And the thing about that dimension is that time runs both ways. It goes both ways. So the challenge for us as believers is, how do we get out of the space-time dimension up into that one? That's what Yeshua did. He lived in that dimension, and it changed things. Amen? How do we get up there? The first is we've got to begin with some basic assumptions that we've got to know and get our mind wrapped around. One is this one. He chose us, Ephesians 1.4, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. If you can't get hold of that, if you can't say, well, that's Bible, I don't understand it all, but it's Bible, I believe that. If you don't know that, you're going to have a hard time stepping into another dimension because you won't comprehend it. We're not meant to walk around in mysteries. We're meant to have knowledge. We have the mind of Christ is what the Bible says. And it begins with an understanding that He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. That means you were known by Abba before space-time began. We don't need to go any further with that than the, just under He knew you before space-time began. He knew you before you were in His mother's womb, is what the prophet says. Before you, your mother was even known. Before creation, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. Now that means anything that was created then uh, came after he already chose you. The other thing we need to know is this one, that the Bible te tells us that there will be an end to the space-time dimension. Heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. Time will be no more. So what you and I live in, the space-time dimension, there was a time when it wasn't, but we were known. There's a time when it will end, and we will live eternally. Eternal life is not marked by the passage of time. You know, say, so isn't that going to be great? You know, I get into eternity and one day I can come up and say, I'm celebrating my 10,000th anniversary. We will not be counting years in eternity. Eternity, by definition, is a dimension that is timeless. Therefore, you don't grow older. Growing older is a, is a you know, come on, it, 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 it's a passage of time. Well, you know, God's an old man sitting in the sky. You're going to be surprised because he lives in an entirely different dimension. Amen? Glory to God. So how do we get the flatlander to understand three dimensions? My question is how do we get you to understand the world of the kingdom of God? 
Turn to somebody and say, I think he's talking to you. <laughs> How do we get you to understand the world of the kingdom of God? Two verses, one I've already shared, but do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the second piece of information you need to get there is that the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. One of the things I think is excited about living in the end times is that science itself is beginning to stumble onto truths that believers have known, truths that rabbis have known about space, time, and what transcends it. And, and they're entering as they began in quantum physics to come, come down and say, you know, what holds the atom together? What holds it together? I mean, we take all the laws of physics we know, we peel it apart, we find a proton, we find an electron, and, and they're long beyond your little high school textbook or college textbook of a little nucleus with something spinning around it. They're long beyond that. You know, they're not quite sure, but right now there's a lot to tend to think. It's probably more like strings than it is like circles, and that they have sound to them and they vibrate. Boy, that sure lines up with the Word of God. Okay, but when they look at the, the very essence of, 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 of an atom, what they don't know is this. They don't know what holds it together. What, what keeps it from exploding? You know, and, and so they, they have all kinds of things, and, and really, some of them have come to call it the God particle. The God particle. The God particle is, they can't find it, they can't see it. Come on, a point in space. Come on, a point in space, it's there, we know it's got to be there, we can't define anything around it, but it has nothing we can look at. Well, the God particle, there's nothing they can see or measure, they just know it's got to be there, otherwise if it wasn't, the atom would fly apart. But the Bible has always taught us that everything in the world is held together by the word of His power. It is a word planet. God said and light was what's holding light together. God said and atoms came into existence. What's holding those together is the word of his, his very spoken word is what's holding the very atom together. Therefore, from that, by the way, we also know that though this seems solid, we know it isn't. It's made up of moving atoms and everything. And we know that atoms respond to sound. Atoms respond to sound. We have been teaching in this ministry for the past seven, eight, nine, ten years, however long we've been around, that the words out of your mouth are creating the environment in which you live. I get more Christians who say, oh, I don't believe that stuff, yet their life is in shambles because it's coming out of their words. I doubt it. I don't believe it. I'm scared to death. I don't, you know, I fear. Words are coming out of their mouth creating an environment. But on the other hand, words that are positive. I mean, we've got scientific evidence of that. We can change the structure of, of ice crystals as they form by the words we speak when they're being formed. Japanese scientists figured that out about 15 years ago. Speak negative words, you get deformed ice crystals. You speak positive words, and you get very beautiful ice crystals. It's a matter of established scientific fact now, science is stumbling onto the edges of what the rabbis have known for years and what people of faith have known. Man without the Spirit does not accept these things. They don't know what to do with these things. And so if we're going to get into another dimension, you've got to do it by the Spirit of God. So faith <laughs> is the final frontier. Without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. So I want to talk to you a, a bit about what is faith. We're going to start this series, and we're going to continue it for however many weeks we go. But we've got to start first by saying, what is faith? For many people, faith is your religion. What faith are you? I'm a Baptist. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Jew. I'm a, what is your faith? And so for many people, the word faith is, is a title. It's to, to describe your denomination. In fact, uh, I was on the Internet uh, when I was preparing this, and I typed in, uh, I went to uh, dictionary.com and typed in the word faith, and there was a little advertisement that popped up. You know, when you go to free sites, they're free because people are advertising on them. And up pops this little box, and it says, um, what is true faith? 
Click here to chat live with a Mormon. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but isn't that interesting? What, what is true faith? You're just looking for the definition of faith, and up it pops. Chat here with a Mormon. My, 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 my. There are people who think that, that faith is some kind of blind hope. But the dictionary says faith is this. It is belief in the doctrines or teaching of religion. Faith is belief in the doctrines or teaching of religion. The dictionary says that faith is belief in anything such as a code of ethics. Strip off code of ethics and what you're left is faith is belief in anything you want to believe in. Thirdly, it says uh, faith is a system of religion like the Christian faith or the Jewish faith. Fourthly, faith is confidence or trust in a person or thing. They're getting a little closer to the Bible now. And fifthly, it says, any, any, firmly had set, any firmly held set of principles. That's your faith. That's your faith. Now, all of you have faith. You have faith in something. You had faith that the seat would hold you up when you sat down. <laughs> Amen. You, you didn't, you know, if three people in a row sat down and fell to the floor, that might shake up your faith. You go to your chair, you're going to push on it first. Why? Because you lost faith. But, you know, you've got faith, you just go ahead and plop down and, and sit down. People have faith. Everybody has faith in something, of something. And what you hold on to in what you believe may be called by others God, but it may have nothing to do with the Bible. Amen? The disciples came to Yeshua one time, and they said to him, Yeshua, teach us how to pray. Now, I puzzled at that as I began to look at Jewish roots and understand some things. One thing that Jews know how to do is pray. Come on, Jews daven all the time, and praying is part of the, the Jewish tradition, Jewish culture. And so all these men prayed, so it's not like they never prayed in their life and they see Yeshua pray, teach us how to pray. You know, they're, they're men who, who know how to pray. What on earth are they doing asking Yeshua? Yeshua, teach us how to pray. And And... I realize there's a simple matter. They prayed and got no answers. He prayed and got answers. So what they wanted to do is teach us how to pray like you pray. We know how to pray the way we pray. But the way we pray gets no results. The way you pray is getting results. I want to pray like you. Now, to me, that's a basic thing. I'm over in my prayer closet praying, 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 praying. God bless me, God bless me, God, I, need, I have needs in my life. And every week, I get nothing. And there's somebody else, they're, they're on there, and they're praying. And, and they come in and say, God met my needs, and I prayed and asked. What did Justin tell us today? Ask. They ask and get. They ask. I'm over here saying, I ask and I don't get. I'm asking and I don't get. I'm asking and I don't get. And over here, praise God, I asked and I got, praise God. Now, you can sit over here and get mad. You can sit over here and say, I understand the Bible. Or you can say, wait a minute, teach me to ask. How are you asking? I mean, obviously, I'm ask, I am asking, but I'm getting nothing. You know, the Bible talks about a people who prayed and the heavens were like brass. Go up to Ben, well, just pray. Just pray isn't going to get you anything. And as we talked in, in the sukkah last night, silent prayers absolutely get you nothing. We're in a word planet. You need to speak. You get nothing by thinking of it. Amen. Bible faith is always a spoken faith. And so when, when we come to understand what faith is, you might say, well, I have faith. My question is, do you have faith that's getting what the Bible says you should get? And if the answer is no, then let's go to the Bible and let, it, let the Bible teach us what faith is. We've got to start from ground, you know, grade one all over again maybe and say, what is faith? And so in Hebrews 11.1, 1, we have a, a basic definition there. This is in the Amplified Bible. There's many translations of it. In fact, the NIV says faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. Basic English says now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the sign of things that are not seen. King James says faith is the substance. Amplified. Now faith is the assurance. We don't need that. Faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for being the proof of things we do not see, and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not yet revealed 
to the senses. Let me highlight some things for you. Faith is assurance, confirmation, and title deed. If I buy some land in Florida, I get on the internet, a guy selling land down in Florida, and I look at it, he's got pictures of it and everything like that, and I send him the money, what am I expecting him to send me? The title deed. Now, if I've got the title deed in my hand, and I come up and I say, you know, I've got land in Florida, and somebody says to me, yeah, right, sure you do. I said, no, 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 I do. I bought it on the internet. Oh, yeah, right, sure. You probably got ripped off. Why am I not moved and threatened? Because I have the title deed. I've got the title deed to it. See, faith is a title deed. When you have biblical faith, it, it's not shaken. Biblical faith isn't shaken. Biblical faith, when you have it, you don't get defensive about it. You don't care what people say about your, your faith stand. When it's biblical faith, it's a title deed. You know that you know that you know that you know you have it. When you've got faith for healing, you will be unmoved by any report of the doctor. Come on, when Ashley was down there at UMass and she's in a coma and they got tubes running here and tubes running there and this going there and everything. And every doctor that came in, you know, the doctor comes in with his little entourage of interns and they discuss what's going on and they make negative statements and Donna stands there and she says, no, that's not going to happen. And no, she's going to get and walk out of here. And they look like, you know, she's not going to walk. We're, we're wondering whether she's going to live and you're talking about walking. Finally, it got to a point where they said, well, maybe she'll get out of here, but it's to go into a nursing home in a vegetative state. But see, when you've got the title deed, you're not moved by what people say. You don't say, oh, no, this is what they're saying. Then you don't have the title deed. When people call me and say, Pastor, I'm believing something, but this is what the bank is saying, Pastor. You don't have faith. You just told me you don't have faith. Faith is a title deed. If you got the title deed, who cares what the bank says? If, if you got the title deed, it doesn't make any difference. Amen. So the, the cry of panic, the cry of uncertainty, the, the wavering in the voice that says, I'm not sure, says, wherever you are, you're probably in great hope. You're probably in great hope, but you're not in biblical faith. Faith is a dimension you live in where you know that you know that you know it. It's not debatable. You live there. I'm a three-dimensional uh, creation. I'm not moved by a flatlander's view of the world. I mean, they can believe all they want as a flatlander, but why am I moved by it? I, I'm a three-dimensional person. Come on. When you start touching the other dimensions of God, there is such confidence in that that when you live among the people of this dimension, it doesn't phase you. It doesn't bother you. Why? You've been there. <laughs> I've been to the mountain. I've seen the Lord. My, 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 my. So it is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed. My dad was uh, in the military. I grew up in, in the military. And, and in the military, they would have promotions that come up. And when you get to the senior levels, uh, you know, uh, lieutenant colonel, major lieutenant colonel and colonel, and obviously the generals, uh, there comes out a list of promotions in the Army Times magazine. And, and so whenever that would show up, I remember when my dad became a colonel, and it showed up in the Army Times that the, the, the Pentagon had put him on the list to be a colonel. And so it comes in the Army Times, you know, this man is being promoted from lieutenant colonel to colonel. So all the officers on the staff wanted to celebrate my dad's promotion. My dad refused. He says, I will not celebrate the promotion until I have the paper in my hand. Why? He'd been around the Army a long time. Name showed up on that list only to be taken off. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't have to happen often till you realize just because it's in the paper doesn't mean it's true. My dad knew, knew that he needed the confirmation, the orders from headquarters. When he had the confirmation, then he said, now I can celebrate it. Now I can go out and buy the colonel's, uh, you know, eagles, and I can put them on now because I've got the confirmation. Amen? Faith is assurance. Faith is confirmation. Faith is different than Hope. There is a place for Bible hope. We'll talk about that maybe next week. It, it is the title deed of the thing you hoped for. <laughs> I'm hoping for something. I really want it. I'm asking. It's a desire. But faith moves you into a realm where it accomplishes something. There were a lot of people who wanted to get healed around Yeshua but didn't. 
But there was a woman who pressed through the crowd. She had an issue of blood. She'd spend everything she had. And she presses through the crowd, which, by the way, was a capital offense for her to be in the crowd touching people. She could have been executed for that. Pushes her way through the crowd, and she grabs hold of uh, Yeshua Ziti. Your English Bible probably says the fringe of his garment. She grabs hold of his Ziti and instantly is healed. And Yeshua turns around and he says, who touched me? And his disciples said, you've got to be kidding. We're in the middle of a crowd and you want to know who touched you? He said, no, someone touched me in faith. And because the touch was in faith, it drew from me. Remember what those other translations say? Faith is the substance. Faith in the higher dimension is a substance which can be measured as clearly as the money in your wallet is a substance in this dimension, and it can be measured. We can find out whether you have a lot of faith or a little faith in the other dimension because it can be seen. When she pulled on faith, something was drawn out of him. Other people touched him, and nothing was drawn out of him. But he drew. You know how, how Donna teaches us when we have a guest uh, speaker coming in, she says, draw on him, draw on him. There is a way you can pull on the anointing. And I'll tell you, we've had a lot of guest preachers who said, boy, I don't know what was going on, but I just felt things being pulled right out of me. That's because we know how to pull. We don't sit there unbelieving. We believe if he's here, God brought him here. He's got something to say, and we're fishing for what's in there that God's going to bring. Amen? And we pull on it, and something happens in the realm of faith. That woman reaches out, but what does she say? It says that she was saying to herself, she was speaking out, when I touch his hem, I'll be healed. When I touch his hem, I'll be healed. Her faith was speaking. She wasn't saying, when I touch his hem, I sure hope this works. Uh, when I touch his hem, maybe if I get two or three in addition to agree with me, it'll happen. See, her faith was clearly defined is, as soon as I touch him, I will be. Well, I wouldn't want to get your hopes up. No, no, I don't want to get your hopes up either. I want you to get into faith. Huh? She's not hoping. As soon as I touch it, and Yeshua turns around, and when he finds out who it is and finds out the story, he says, woman, your faith healed you. Not me. Not Yeshua, the Son of God. Not me, the healer. I'm not the one that healed you. Your faith healed you. Why? Your faith touched me. Oh, glory to God. Your faith touched me, and through me, I'm simply a conduit. I'm plugged into another dimension. And when you touch me, you drew from that other dimension right through me. It's not me. I'm just one walking in this dimension. And when you touch that, you draw on that. It is an assurance, it is a confirmation, and it is proof. Come on, faith is all the proof you need. That's why when you're seeking for signs, <laughs> you're not in faith. Now, that doesn't mean that God isn't gracious and merciful and doesn't work through signs. Gideon is a good example of that. But, of course, Gideon also didn't have the presence of the Holy Spirit working in his life. But, you know, we don't need signs. Because when you have faith, that's all the proof. I need two things. I need faith and I need a scripture. That's an unbeatable combination. Because faith can't be in, in anything. It's got to be in the Word of God. If I know what the Word says and then I apply faith to it, that's all the proof I need. That's all the proof I need. Amen? It's not often a question of do we have the scripture. It is most often the question, do we have enough faith? It is the proof of things that we do not see, and the conviction of their reality. I remember years ago, I was just beginning to learn some things about faith. And, you know, I could see faith for healing and faith for, for relationships and faith when it came to human beings. But what about faith on inanimate objects? That's because I thought they were inanimate. And, and I read about Gloria Copeland, and Gloria Copeland talked about having a, a garbage disposal that was stopped up in her house and how she spoke to it and it opened up and you know, that staggered my mind I, I can still picture it I was down living in Worcester at the time and and I, you know it's like you, she spoke to the garbage disposal well a few weeks later I had our garbage disposal got absolutely stopped up 
I, I, tink I did what men do. I tinkered, poked, plugged, you know, did everything. The thing wouldn't, wouldn't run. I don't know if it was clogged or what. It just wouldn't run. And, and you know, I, I, I could have tried to have faith for a new garbage disposal, I guess, but, I, you know, I, my faith wasn't working in the realm of money either. And, and, I, and I thought back to Gloria Copeland's thing, and I thought, well, I can do what she did. So I went into my kitchen, and I made sure no one was around. That's a good indication you're not in faith. Come on. And looking around, why? Because if this, if this doesn't work, I don't want to look foolish. You're not in faith. <laughs> but I'm looking around. The kids aren't there, you know. So I walk in the kitchen, and I go up to the sink, and I say, Garbage disposal, in the name of Jesus, work. And I walk over to the switch. Ah, oh, didn't work. Well, that, that was even limited hope, let alone faith. There was no faith in that. And, and you know, and, and so I got, got thinking about it, and I thought, well, there's, there, there's got to be a problem here. Either the word doesn't work or Don Long doesn't know how to work it. And I came to a brilliant conclusion. God doesn't have a problem, I do. <laughs> That's a brilliant conclusion. You know, if the Bible promises things, you can speak to the mountain. Come on, speak to the mountain move. I'm trying to speak to a garbage disposal to move. Forget the mountain. And I realized I didn't have enough faith. Well, what do you do when you don't have enough faith? What do you do when you're hungry? You eat. So if I don't have enough faith, faith comes how? You know it, by hearing and hearing of the Word of God. I need more Word. I don't need Word about other things. I need Word about faith. So I got faith books out, and I read about faith, and I underlined the verses in my Bible about faith. And I remember one day sitting there, the sun's coming in the window. It's in the morning. It's probably about a week later. And I'm just, I'm reading about faith, going all over my verses, and all of a sudden something connects. I mean, something just connects inside. Excuse me. I put my book down. I go walk in that kitchen. I said, garbage disposal, I speak to you in the name of Jesus. You will work for a child of God that I am. Click, and it worked. And I said, isn't that great? No, I did not. It worked, and I went, yeah! I looked like Scott. <laughs> I looked like Scott. <laughs> See, what was the problem? I... I I, I, I had no conviction of the reality of it. See, faith has got to be your conviction. That's why you can't do it on my faith. That's why I can't do it on, on Gloria Copeland's faith. Faith is, I am convinced that what God said He means and what He promised me He'll do, He will do. And I have absolute, well, pastor, I know someone who believed that and they died I know people who get in cars and die. I know people who fly in airplanes and die. I don't stop driving and I don't stop flying. Sorry, your faith didn't work, but I know faith works. I see it work in other people's lives. I see it in the Scriptures. I want to learn how to live on that dimension. I don't have time to debate with those who say it doesn't work. What a dumb way to get to try to prove to people faith doesn't work. I mean, shh, that's doing the devil's work, calling yourself a, a Christian. The conviction of the reality, but this great thing. Faith perceives as real fact what is not yet revealed to your senses. When Ashley was four and she was diagnosed with leukemia and she was in the hospital, Donna would meet people at the doorway when they're going to go visit her. And she even did this to her own mother. She said, listen, Mom, when you go in there, if you're going to be moved by what you see and you're going to speak negative things or you're going to cry, then don't come in. You stay at home and do whatever you want to do. But we're in a battle for life here, and, uh, you know, we need people in faith. And she said that for an interesting reason because, you know, Ashley's legs were just like little skin and bones. and I mean, she was just this little, looked like a Biafran baby. And, uh, uh, and it was amazing because Donna was walking, and she said, oh, yeah, you know, she's going back to school. And, what do you mean she's going back to school? And the doctors say, you know, her hair is going to fall out. And I said, no, won't you have a full head of hair? And, and yeah, she'll be able to swim, and she'll be able to do all these things. And, 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 and Donna was just walking in this world. That's why they sent psychiatrists to her. Everyone can see that it's not good. Everyone can see. I had Christians who said, you know, you, you, you better talk with Donna. They, 
She's not seeing. She's checked out. Oh, yeah, she did check out. She checked out into another dimension. She checked into a dimension where she perceived as a real fact what was not yet revealed to those who were walking in their senses. And it was years and years later, we're looking through some photographs one day, and, and, and I pulled out a picture of Ashley back then, and uh, she was probably a teenager by the time we're looking at this picture, and, and Donna looks at this picture and tears well up in her eyes. And she says to me, I never saw her like that. She said, literally, I never, I never saw that. Why? Because in the middle of the battle, that's the dimension in which she is living. Faith perceives as a real fact what is not yet revealed to the senses. My, 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 my. So, so when we come to understand faith, we got to understand we're embarking again on a journey of faith where this is the most serious of issues. Come on, we're going to be in the end time. A thousand may fall at your left hand, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. That's a biblical promise. The only kinds of things that I know that can be described as 11,000 dying and you're left standing are either massive biological warfare or nuclear warfare. Because I believe that, I don't, th I don't think the Bible's using hyperbole there. 10,000 at your left hand, 1,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near me. And I have people that go around and say, I believe that, I believe that. And yet, man, they're falling apart over little things. You, excuse me, oh, there's a bee getting on me. Ah! I mean, if you're frightened of a bee, what are you going to do when 11,000 people die of the flu? What's going to come out of your mouth? Oh, my God, I better not go to the store. You know the flu's going around. You're not in faith. You're not convinced that you can walk through it. John G. Lake, in the middle of that uh, um, amazing plague that was taking pla place in Africa. Go read it. You can find it in his book. He's there. People are dying left and right. He's ministering to people. And the doctors come to him and say, Dr. Lake, we, he's not a f physician doctor. He's another kind of doctor. But he said, Dr. Lake, we don't understand why, you know, you're not getting this disease. I mean, health workers were falling sick and everything. And, and he'd never done this, but he, he knew the answer. He said, look, go over to that person that just died, that, that, that disease-filled froth, froth that's on them, put it on my hand and put it under the microscope. They put some on the hand, looked under the microscope, every germ that was in there died. Touching his body, it died. Well, come on. We know that if God is present, nothing evil is going to be alive in his presence is going to die. Yeshua himself said, you know, had to release himself in order to be killed. They couldn't have killed him. And, and John G. I mean, amazing. And that's documented. But, but why should that surprise us? If we under, hey, a thousand may fall at the left hand, ten thousand at my right hand, it will not come near me. Why? I'm immune. Germs die in my presence. Why? Because I'm filled with the glory of God. I have purified my heart. I've purified my life. I'm a son of the Most High. I'm an ambassador for Christ on a holy assignment. I'm a brand new creation. And the life of God, Zoe life, Zoe life in here is penetrated my body. That's why Paul says, work your salvation out. You're saved in your spirit, man. For, but, but for your sake, not God's sake, for your sake, get it out of your spirit, man, into your body, into your thinking, so that you're absolutely saturated with the life of God, so that when you touch people, the very life of God flows through you. You change the atmosphere when you walk in a room because you're a carrier. You're contagious with the goodness of God. Amen? My, 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 my. There is a seriousness to faith. And that's that verse that we started out, which will be our theme. Without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. Doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Doesn't mean you're not going to go to heaven when you die. We're not talking about salvation here. This is not a salvation message. This is a message about how do we live in the kingdom of God in the midst of a world that's falling apart. How do we choose to live in another dimension rather than make the choice that much of the church makes today of living just like the world? 
we watch what the world watches on TV, we eat what the world eats, we, we do whatever the world does, and guess what? We get the same sicknesses and disease and results that the world is getting because we're living like the world. We're going to go to heaven when we die, but we're just absolutely emaciated in terms of our faith. Or we can choose that we're going to live on another dimension. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God must believe two things. You must believe these two things. I don't think any Christian would ever be in a position where they don't believe, number one, that he exists. But I get a lot of fight and feedback in the body of Christ from pastors and teachers who argue about number two. You must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is a rewarder. He is not someone who puts him down. The reward is not sickness. Come on, you're insane to think that's a reward. The reward is not poverty. The reward is not you're at the bottom. I'm just being humble for Jesus. No, you're not. You're being self-centered. You must believe. You must believe that God will reward you for diligently seeking Him. Now, diligence doesn't mean, well, I come to church now and then. Diligence doesn't mean, well, I listen now and then. Diligence is I am seeking it. I am pursuing what God says. I'm hungry for His. I am searching. I'm using my concordance. I'm looking through the Bible. What are the promises about money? People say, Pastor, I have a financial need. Do you know any of the financial blessing promises? Well, somewhere it says something about giving and, 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 and it will be given to you. Uh, uh, something about, oh, I don't know, isn't it something we say, uh, Pastor, we say it in church about uh, storehouses? You are not diligent. And you've got to believe He's going to reward you if you earnestly or diligently seek Him. Man, if, if I in were in a point where my finances were falling apart, that's all I'm going to, my body's well, I don't need healing, I need money. I'm going to read everything the Bible says about money. I'm going to know the verses. I'm going to write them out. I'm going to say them every day, every single day, many times during that day. My God meets all my needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I get a bill and there's nothing in the checkbook for it. I'm going to say, my God meets my... I'm going to speak word, speak word, speak word, speak word. Why? Because I'm going to be diligent, earnestly, in seeking His Word to work in my life. And my Bible says He'll reward me if I do that. But it does not say He'll reward you just because you know the verse is there. Faith is very active. Faith is not some kind of, well, I just have faith. Faith is work. Faith is effort. Faith means you've got to push against the opposition of the enemy that is bombarding your mind with, it cannot be, it will not be. Faith will come to steal it before you get it. Then faith will try to steal it after you have it. Preacher was talking about how he was afraid of flying, and he said, that's ridiculous, I'm a child of God. And he went down to the airport, and he got on a plane to fly from California to Texas, and he said, all the way down to the airport, the devil says, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. No, I'm not going to die. I shall live. I've got my verses. God's my protector. And got on there and he flew all the way for the first time in his life. Flew down to, to Texas. And, and, and as he got off the plane, he thought, you know, great, I did it. And this voice says to him, but you're going to die on the way home. <laughs> Come on, the devil's not going to give up. He's going to be speaking. Faith is active. Faith is aggressive. Faith pushes Faith has got to say, I know the Word, I stay in the Word, I speak the Word as, as much as I can. Watch this. It's impossible to please God, but you must believe. Two things, you've got to believe exists and, everybody say and, that He will reward you. And there's the key. God's a rewarder. There are some things that set me free on understanding some things. One that Justin read today. Which of you is a father? If your son asks for a loaf of bread, is going to give him a snake. You know, once I became a dad, I realized, duh, I mean, I might not be the greatest dad in the world, but I know I wouldn't give my son a snake if he asked for a loaf. How much more will your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask? And in that opened up a whole understanding, God is like a father. I, you know, I will discipline my children, but I would never push them down a flight of stairs to break their legs because they were disobedient. I would not to say, my child, you know, you, you've been rebellious, you've had a sloppy attitude, you're not being what you should, you're not pulling your weight around here, so I'm going to put cancer on you. What kind of a dad would I be? 
And yet people will say, God put this sickness on me to teach me something. I think that is blasphemous. That is offensive to my father. That you accuse him of doing what in our own dimension itself would be considered child abuse. God does not do that. And when I saw that, I said, wow, no, he's a rewarder. I grew up in a church that taught me God does these things. God could challenges in your life. God tests you by accidents. You had an accident, God's testing you. That's right out of the pit of hell. There is a God that is testing you. It's a God called Satan, the God of this world. Amen. But my God, say my God. My God rewards those who diligently seek him. My God is a rewarder. He is just waiting for you to get earnest about your, your, what you want. He's waiting for you to say, I want it, and I'm willing to pay the price. He's, he's waiting for you to say, I'm going to get my word, and I'm going to get into it. And guess what? TV shows don't matter anymore. I need healing. Forget the TV, man. I'm in the word. I need my marriage restored. I get in the word. I need an answer. I get in the word. I need a job. I'm in the word constantly. Why? Because I'm going to do my part, which is diligently seek him, because I have faith. I have faith that if I'll do my part, he will do his part. He, he, he will do his part. My goodness. I, I've walked all my life, you know, skirting around the edges of faith, sometimes understanding it, sometimes, but all I needed was to make a move towards God, and he's there. That's all you got to do is start moving toward him, and he's there. He's ready. He wants to demonstrate himself strong in your behalf. And above all, he wants to build up your faith. Because without faith, you can't please Him. But with faith, all things are possible. There's not a thing in our economy you need to be afraid of. There's not a disease on this planet that you need to be afraid of. I'm not going down and saying, oh, i got to get all kinds of inoculations. My goodness, you can get your flu shots every place you want. I mean, you can go into the great grocery store, get your flu shot. You can go to the post office, get your flu shot. I mean, you do what you want to do, but I'm not counting on what the world has to offer. Because you know what? We're, we're going to enter a time when the world has no answers. We're going to, it, it doesn't, right, it doesn't have answers. I mean, they don't, they don't have answers. And they're afraid, afraid, afraid of the super bug that's going to come. Guess what's going to happen? It's going to come. Of course it's going to come. Why is it going to come? Because everybody's confessing that it's going to come. Come on, we are in a word planet. You know, well, the economy's going to collapse. It probably will. It will. I won't. You won't. Come on, economies have collapsed all over history. Everybody in the economy didn't die. The Great Depression didn't decimate America. Nobody was left alive. Come on. You, you say, well, I might lose my job. Well, first of all, it's not your job. It's the employer's job. You don't own it. <laughs> you know? And he's got worse problems than you if he's got to start letting everybody go. <laughs> if you're a child of God, you work for the most high. Right. Amen? Amen. I, I mean, God can bring it by the raven if he has to, but I think he's got much better ways to bring it. Well, I just don't know how. That's true. You don't. You don't know how. I can't see how God could do that. Right in this dimension, you can't see. But if you step up into another dimension, come on. I don't know. God might say, look, go out, go fishing today. Fishing, I need money. Go fishing, and you pull up a fish, and there's a you know, $100 bill in the fish's mouth. Oh, I don't believe that stuff. Then it won't happen for you. <laughs> come on. <laughs> you know, I mean... Did, did, was God a favorite to them and he's not and, and he doesn't like you so he wouldn't do it for us today? God has ways. I mean, come on, you know Pastor Arthur's mother's story. You know, there she is living in Haiti, the poorest place you can imagine to live in this hemisphere. And she prospers. She becomes a very, very wealthy woman, starting out as a, a woman on the street selling, you know, not a street lady, but a, gar a garment seller. She buy something and sell it. Go back and buy two pieces. Sell the two pieces. Go buy four and sell them. And she started out just selling garments. Ended up owning a whole garment business down there. Cut out all the middlemen. Flew to the United States to New York. Bought her garments in in, in bulk or material. Took it down to Haiti. Had a house in Haiti. Had a house up here. Amen. Amen. Don't tell me God can't do that. God's demonstrating Himself strong. 
Amen? And you and I got to say, wait a minute, I want to learn this stuff. I see the signs around. I see what's going on. I'm going to be a faith woman. I'm going to be a faith man. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to be diligent. I'm going to get it under my belt. I'm going to renew my mind. I'm not going to be a flatlander. Turn to somebody next to you and say, don't be a flatlander. <laughs> I'm going to step in. I'm going to step into the dimensions of God where all of a sudden it is easy to get your prayers answered. Did you get anything out of this today? Father, we thank you and praise you for your love for us. We thank you for uh, how you minister your word to us. We thank you for life as it comes to us. You're such an awesome God. Thank you for teaching us about faith, walking us through faith, your desire by your spirit to build us up in faith, to encourage us in faith. Thank you that you are preparing us to live in victory in the midst of whatever goes down in this world. You're preparing us to be the joy-filled people of God. Thank you for this season of tabernacles. When you've come to tabernacle among us and to stir us up, Abba, we have great joy because we are your children. And all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Well, children, if I can get you up here, we want to get your blessing on you before you go today. Scott and Sherry, if you would get the uh, hoopah.